Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ellen. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks very much for coming out on a cold night. Uh, it didn't snow all that much, uh, according to uh, everyone I spoke to uh, today. Um, I'd like to thank the council for the invitation and Dixie Anderson and uh, Kathy Kickert for uh, making logistics possible and helping arrange this. It's a very well-run organization, I have to say. I'd like to thank the board as well. I had a wonderful dinner with some members of the board uh, last night. Um, and Aquinas College as well. Thanks for hosting this. Um, as, uh, as Ellen mentioned, I'm with the RAND Corporation. I've been there for 20 years now. RAND is a public policy research organization. It's uh, nonpartisan. It aims to be objective. It aims to be very thorough. Um, it was created, uh, I think, in 1948. Uh, about half of our work is in national security. Uh, areas. About half is in domestic areas. We have a very vibrant health policy program, uh, education policy programs, and, and a number of others. I primarily work uh, in RAND's national security programs, uh, doing work for uh, Department of Defense clients and, and some others. Uh, let me start with a disclaimer. Having affiliated myself with RAND, I'm now going to distance myself from RAND. Um, my comments today represent my own personal opinions here. This doesn't reflect uh, uh, peer-reviewed RAND work, um, uh, so uh, please keep that in mind. And I met some very good lawyers from Warner Norcross who will help me with that uh, last, last night. Um, what I'd like to do, um, I, I thought hard about how to organize this and without it seeming to be what the British call sort of a dog's dinner of odd bits thrown together. And so I played around with the organization a considerable amount and first thing I did was pretty much change the ordering uh, from, um, from what, the, uh, what the title said. What I'd like to do um, is talk somewhat briefly about the Persian Gulf uh, and oil and Iraq and Iran. And um, I'd like these comments generally to be viewed as sort of some uh, observations, uh, a set of uh, hopefully useful insights into thinking about this and identifying some signposts and things that might be monitored uh, going forward. And these comments are largely, uh, I think, addressed to some of the students here in the hope that maybe they'll want to uh, pick up with some of these questions and explore them in uh, more detail. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, focus the balance of my comments um, on Al-Qaeda, uh, which is an area that I've been working on for about the last four or five years. Um, I've been following uh, Al-Qaeda's uh, ideology, uh, their uh, strategic thought, uh, their propaganda activities and other activities uh, over this time. And um, that's, I think, really uh, where I'm best positioned uh, to, uh, to speak to these issues. Okay, let's start with the Persian Gulf. Um, the Persian Gulf is well known to be strategically important. It has been so for a couple of centuries uh, now. We essentially uh, inherited the British responsibility for security in the, result, uh, in, in the Gulf um, after the uh, British withdrew from east of Suez and the 1973-74 uh, oil shocks after the 1973 war. Uh, brought uh, this region into focus because all of a sudden gas prices were, were climbing and we were having economic consequences from that. So where we'd enjoyed cheap oil and cheap gasoline before, this became very much a, a, an important uh, uh, policy and strategy issue. I first began work um, on, the, on the Gulf uh, when I was a junior analyst at the NSC staff uh, in the 1980s. This was at the time of Iran-Iraq War, and some of you may remember the Gulf reflagging operations where uh, the U.S. put flags on foreign tankers to put them under U.S. Uh, protection. So I followed uh, the Gulf reflagging operations pretty closely uh, during this period. And that was really the first, uh, my first sort of operational uh, exposure beyond uh, just sort of an academic um, exposure. More recently, uh, Saudi uh, interest, uh, Kuwaiti interest, other uh, sorts of Arab nations there have figured fairly prominently in um, the 
uh, broader context uh, for the emergence of Al-Qaeda and the Salafi Jihadi trend, which is a very, very narrow uh, trend within Sunni Islam and within Salafi thought. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that uh, in a bit. Okay, the strategic importance um, of the Gulf um, obviously arises from its important, uh, importance as, uh, uh, as a uh, source of oil for most of the world. 55% of proved oil reserves are in the Persian Gulf. This, uh, oh, this uh, slide on the top shows the estimated proved oil reserves from 1980 until 2008. And a couple of things are distinctive. One, the, uh, the large uh, proportion of world oil reserves accounted for uh, by the Persian Gulf. The other is the occasional discoveries of new resources that have bumped up world proved oil resources. So uh, we've been fortunate in some ways in discovering uh, additional oil or, uh, and, and making it available um, in, in the market. Um, the panel on the bottom is a chart that I um, found in a uh, paper that was done for the Energy Information Administration and uh, United States Geological Survey that was a, uh, an examination of peak oil theory and what the empirical record had to say about peak oil theory. I'd sort of, uh, previous to finding this paper, thought that it was uh, uh, generally a highly contentious issue and a somewhat questionable issue, but this was really the first analysis that I had seen that seemed to credibly bring together the supply side of oil and the demand side of oil and reason about when uh, oil stocks uh, might uh, peak and then, and then decline over time with the expectation that the decline of the stocks also would be associated with, uh, with price increases. And this panel on the bottom shows uh, three potential peaks that, uh, uh, that are, uh, are related to assumptions about uh, the, uh, the likelihood of um, oil stocks peaking in that year. The mean uh, forecast, there was some simulation modeling that went on um, in this analysis, the mean forecast was that uh, oil stocks would peak in 2037. Um, what this says to me is that Persian Gulf oil is going to remain a strategic interest to us for a couple few decades at least going forward. And the vast natural gas deposits uh, could uh, also help to sustain its strategic interest for the US uh, even beyond, um, beyond that time. Okay. Um, it's also the case that uh, the Persian Gulf uh, has been a, a quite unstable region. Uh, there's been an ongoing rivalry between uh, three of the larger uh, countries there, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, and Iraq. Um, in 1979, we saw the Iranian Revolution. Uh, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Iran in the hope of taking advantage of that, which began uh, the uh, Iran-Iraq War, an eight-year war, terribly catastrophic on, on both sides. In 1990, Saddam invaded Kuwait and was ejected uh, in, in 1991. And then in the 1990s, there were ongoing crises and uh, brandishing of military gear and that sort of thing as a result of uh, Iraqi intransigence in the face of, um, of inspections following the war. And of course, um, the U.S. Uh, intervention uh, in Iraq and uh, the, the fabric of Iraqi society fell apart for several years thereafter. More recently, or most recently, the Iranian nuclear program and domestic instability have figured pretty prominently here, and uh, they're not uh, unrelated uh, in my uh, opinion. Speaking now to the students um, and, in, and thinking about some of the uh, points that I made earlier, I think there are a number of signposts that can be monitored going forward to try to understand this phenomenon of peak oil the continued strategic importance of Persian Gulf oil and so on. And uh, what I've tried to do is organize those in terms of uh, things that can be monitored on the supply side. And those include discovery of new oil reserves and uh, new technological ability to extract and substitution, oil shale, things like that. And on the demand side, uh, because higher levels of economic growth are going to consume higher levels of oil, lower economic growth will consume lower oil and so on. So um, this, uh, I'll just leave the Persian Gulf oil question on, on that slide, and maybe we can return to it in, in our uh, comment and, and question period. Moving to Iraq, 
Um, obviously, in March 2003, we undertook a war against Saddam. The U.S. prevailed and, and, and the chaos ensued. Most recently, in February 2009, President Obama uh, announced a timetable for withdrawal. Uh, we're looking at uh, August 2010 for the date for the departure of U.S. combat troops and the end of uh, 2011 for all troops uh, from Iraq. And um, my own view on this is that um, the developments on the ground are going to be uh, quite uh, important here, but also uh, the U.S. public's willingness to continue supporting this operation through that timeline. I would also add that the Iraqi people and leadership are going to be a crucial variable in this. Um, so uh, looking forward on Iraq, um, what I would suggest monitoring is the U.S. progress benchmarks, and there are a couple of reports that uh, interesting, interested parties can turn to for that. Uh, there's a quarterly report from the Department of Defense that uh, tries to do an accounting of how well things are going on the security front, on the development front, and so on. Uh, the Brookings Institution has an Iraq index that tries to document data that tracks progress. Um, looking forward, uh, the Iraqi debathification efforts are going to be uh, crucially important here, and those are already quite contentious, and there's some uh, possibility, it's difficult to, uh, to assess uh, how, um, how likely this is, but there's some possibility that this will affect uh, Sunni acceptance of the results of the upcoming March uh, elections, uh, which are uh, parliamentary elections. Um, it's also uncertain the extent to which Al-Qaeda in Iraq and its front organization, the Islamic State of Iraq, might be able to exploit uh, Sunni grievances following, uh, following these elections. Um, the Iranians are very much in play through agents and support to militant groups. Uh, there is something uh, at the, uh, something called the trigger line at the uh, Iraqi Kurdish border that is a, a point of contention. I didn't, I didn't really recognize this until I read uh, General Odierno's uh, comments uh, about, a, uh, about a week ago. Uh, at the Army and Navy Club. If you haven't seen them, they're, they're well worth reading because I think he gives a pretty good unvarnished picture of what's happening and where the uncertainties are going forward um, on Iraq. And I think you also want to look for signs that U.S. influence is waning as U.S. military forces decline. I think we're seeing some indications of that already. And obviously, uh, having less leverage means that as we get closer to the end of this, we'll uh, will uh, be less capable of um, influencing outcomes. All right, Iran, the uh, nuclear dossier. This is a very hot topic. Uh, I, one of the joys and horrors of giving a presentation on something that's as topical is that changes happen up to the day of the briefing. And uh, this morning, um, for those of you who hadn't heard, uh, Iran announced that it was going to be building uh, 10 additional centrifuge uh, capabilities to boost its capacity to enrich, uh, er, enrich uh, uranium. Uh, this slide aims to summarize the uh, sort of changing perspectives uh, on uh, the Iranian nuclear threat, uh, starting with a national intelligence estimate. This is uh, the uh, unclassified key judgments from the uh, national intelligence estimate that was released in uh, 2007, um, but then was challenged by the British um, and uh, in this, uh, this last year, starting in uh, May, um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, was saying that Iran could be perhaps as close to uh, a year away uh, from having, uh, having a weapon. The uh, discovery of um, the facility uh, near Qum uh, resulted in an announcement from uh, uh, the, the US, the UK, and uh, uh, the French uh, of that discovery, which I think caught the Iranians uh, by surprise. Uh, there's a very good report from earlier this month that looks at the technical uh, capabilities and outlook produced by uh, David Albright and a co-author. Uh, Albright is from uh, the uh, uh, Institute for Science and International Security. That's worth reading if you have a, a technical bent uh, in this area. On the 18th of this month, the IAEA came out and essentially uh, disputed the earlier national intelligence estimate, saying that, in fact, uh, work on, uh, on uh, uh, weaponry had continued past uh, 2004. Um, it's, a, it's a good report. It also reported that uh, 
uh, Iran had achieved uh, nearly 20% enrichment, which uh, is the level required for their medical reactor. Um, they also reported uh, some decline in centrifuge operations, which is uh, in some ways the only good news here that uh, they weren't uh, having, uh, they weren't able to maintain their centrifuges to be able to produce uh, enriched uranium. And as I mentioned uh, just this morning, um, uh, was the announcement that uh, another 10 facilities were going to be built. Now, signposts to monitor, again, turning uh, primarily to, uh, to uh, students uh, in, um, in the audience, um, in terms of trying to anticipate the outcome on this issue, the places to look, I think, include the permanent five of the United Nations Security Council, especially China, which I think in many ways has been closest uh, to Iran and uh, will be a bellwether in terms of uh, what the uh, Security Council action will look like. Um, Iranian factional maneuvering is, uh, is going to be in play, and Iran is a terribly complicated political society, and the factional maneuvering um, is, um, is, is fairly substantial. There are a number of different actors and factions in play on this issue. The Supreme Leader, who's um, in, I think, a, a reduced position in terms of his credibility and his authority following his endorsement of Ahmadinejad's uh, election. Uh, Ahmadinejad himself and his principal lists, the hardliners that he's associated with, the IRGC and the Basij that provide uh, both the Supreme Leader and Ahmadinejad a lot of their power base, the chairman of the Guardian Council, uh, Janati, who's a hardliner, Speaker of the Consultative Assembly, Larajani, who used to be Iran's uh, nuclear negotiator and is, is a little bit of a, a technocrat, the director of their atomic energy organization. Um, Foreign Minister Mataki um, is an interesting one to watch. Um, in the recent proposal uh, to have the Russians uh, convert Iranian uranium and return, um, return fuel rods, uh, Mataki, um, surprisingly enough, along with Ahmadinejad, indicated that they were not ruling that out, that in fact they sort of favored that solution. This was about two weeks ago before, uh, before things uh, um, uh, have, um, have, have sort of escalated. Now the moderates um, don't really, to my eyes, seem to have played particularly importantly here, and they may want to keep their heads down. They've got enough problems uh, within Iran, um, uh, particularly after the failure of the February 11th uh, um, uh, um, events uh, where the hope was that they would be able to stand up and uh, contest uh, Iranian authority. And then lastly, um, Rafsanjani, uh, who's uh, another uh, cleric, a very influential one, who is the chairman of the Assembly of Experts, which, make, which, gives, uh, which gives him some say over whether uh, the Supreme Leader Khamenei stays or goes. Uh, he's also uh, chairman of the uh, Expedia Council, which was a, an organization that was created to help uh, break deadlock uh, in Iran. There are a number of different power centers and they tend to check and balance one another. So they created this wonderful device called the Expediency Council to speed things along, presumably. All right, additionally, reported evidence of progress on weaponization and miniaturization. Those are obviously crucially important. Those are separate issues from the enrichment, uh, the enrichment issue. Uh, and then lastly, um, of, of some importance, is um, the Israeli response to U.S. efforts to provide some security assurances uh, during this period uh, where Iran seems to be moving towards nuclear weapons. Okay. Now that was relatively quickly through and at a fairly high level, and I apologize for that, but I really wanted to get to uh, talking about Al-Qaeda because this is really, um, I think, in many ways where, uh, where my expertise, uh, expertise lies. Um, this is sort of a summary of the main points I'd like to make, that 9-11 attacks uh, followed a long period uh, where Al-Qaeda was trying to find a threshold that would lead the U.S. to intervene with uh, large ground forces. Um, and the expectation that they had, they calculated that this sort of U.S. Res response would lead to the mobilization of the Muslim world under Al-Qaeda's banner. All right, they were completely wrong about that. It turned out that 9-11 and the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan was a catastrophe for them, an utter catastrophe. Uh, 
their aim is to create um, a caliphate uh, following uh, the departure of the U.S. They're, they were hopeful that once the U.S. had intervened en masse in the Muslim world, that we would burn our hands and we would leave forever, and that with our departure, we would no longer be propping up regimes that al-Qaeda considers to be apostate regimes. Okay, so by getting the U.S. in and then out, al-Qaeda reckoned that they would then be free to uh, start building their caliphate. All right, AQ has tried very hard since they were ejected from Afghanistan to reconstitute their operational capabilities. They're under uh, significant pressure. And um, most recently, some of you uh, may have seen uh, the testimony uh, during the annual threat assessment um, on the Hill uh, by uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, FBI Director and the DIA Director. And the, uh, the uh, Director of National Intelligence, uh, Dennis Blair, when asked by Mrs. Pelosi uh, to um, uh, provide an estimate of the likelihood that al-Qaeda was going to seek, to seek to attack the U.S. again, uh, said that it was certain in his mind that al-Qaeda would attempt another attack on the U.S. Uh, within the next six months. So um, I think that the, uh, the uh, December 25th hijacking attempt was uh, perhaps the first shot uh, by al-Qaeda in recent memory to, uh, to engage in a campaign um, against the U.S. We'll have to see how successful they are. One hopes that the training this Nigerian received or his um, capabilities to launch attacks are typical of others that have been enlisted to undertake attacks against the U.S. So this is an overview of my argument uh, with respect to al-Qaeda. Uh, last point being that um, even after al-Qaeda is defeated, I think their ideology presents uh, some significant challenges and threats, and I'll be talking about each of these uh, different, different points. Okay, this is my conception of Al-Qaeda's grand strategy. Uh, there are two main lines of operation, uh, jihad as violent armed struggle, and propaganda and media operations to take what is, are essentially tactical uh, actions and consequences and create strategic effects. Now, on the top arrow, jihad is violent armed struggle. There are two pieces to that, the strategy against the U.S., 9-11 attacks, as I mentioned, to draw U.S. forces into Muslim lands, stretch our forces, bust our coalitions so we're bearing all of the costs, increase those costs on the U.S., exhaust us, and force us to leave the Muslim world. Again to bear the throats of uh, the, the various uh, regimes in the Muslim world. It's a fairly preposterous construct. Um, it's not something that I think anybody thinking serious, seriously about it would believe, but this is what they, what they believe or believed. And as I mentioned, it didn't really play out as well as they would have liked because 9-11 did not result in the mass mobilization of the Muslim world that they were hoping and expecting. Now, they also have um, a, a caliphate strategy, and part of this has been developed since 9-11, and as sort of plan B, if you will, uh, because the, the first plan didn't work out uh, as well as they would have liked. And what they aim to do is uh, exploit what um, the um, Salafi jihadi strategic writer Abu Bakr Naji calls zones of savagery, places like the uh, Pakistani tribal regions, like uh, the Yemeni mountainous regions and so on, that are essentially ungoverned and lawless, where they can move into a vacuum and where they can uh, establish some control and they can uh, implement uh, their form of Sharia and, um, and then uh, use that uh, um, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a new sanctuary. Now, another uh, element in the strategy is to use dispersed cellular organizations. There's a, another strategic thinker, Salafi Jihadi, who is affiliated with, um, with al-Qaeda, is now under custody, named uh, Abu Musab al-Suri. And um, he wrote a, uh, a, an opus called The Call to Global Islamic Resistance. And one aspect of that was he enjoined al-Qaeda 
to, organize, to use dispersed cellular organizations. The hierarchical organization that they had had prior to 9-11 got rolled up pretty quickly. It created all sorts of operational security issues. And he thought that one solution was to develop these sort of cellular organizations and split the organization up so that uh, jihadi action uh, could continue without having a uh, catastrophic failure if one of these uh, organizations uh, was rolled up. Now, after the uh, US intervention, in Iraq, um, their aim to secure a lodgment in the Arab world um, was presented with an opportunity uh, to use Iraq as that lodgment. Uh, and uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was a Salafi jihadi, a Jordanian, um, negotiated uh, with uh, Al-Qaeda Central and ultimately was branded as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, branding and franchising um, in a bit. but. It, they were prolonged negotiations, as far as we can tell, uh, leading to the creation of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is a, a branded um, Al-Qaeda affiliate. Um, following uh, Zarqawi's death in June 2006, uh, in November of that year, uh, an announcement was made of an Islamic State of Iraq. And that was essentially an Al-Qaeda in Iraq front organization uh, that had enlisted a small number of other groups but was essentially led by um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So Al-Qaeda Central, at that point, had found their lodgment and created their emirate, and they started talking about how Iraq would be the nucleus of the caliphate and the stepping stone to Jerusalem, to Quds. So they were trying, on the one hand, uh, uh, to identify Iraq as a place for uh, jihadis and would-be jihadis to go to help form this emirate and help, uh, help uh, stabilize this emirate. On the other hand, they were exploiting the Palestinian issue, which they have identified as perhaps the best issue to exploit in terms of uh, getting, getting sympathy from the broader Muslim world. All right, so creating the Islamic uh, emirate uh, starting in Iraq and then destabilizing to, uh, to export jihad neighbors and uh, begin the march towards uh, Jerusalem and ultimately to expand to create an Islamic, Islamic caliphate. Now, uh, this idea of creating uh, Islamic emirates really is uh, somewhat impract impractical as well, perhaps somewhat more practical than the aim of a, a larger Islamic uh, caliphate. And this uh, motif of Islamic Emirates has come up time and time and again in a number of different uh, regions and countries where um, Al Qaeda affiliates have sought to establish uh, a present uh, presence. Now, on the propaganda to incite jihad and win hearts and minds, uh, they have a, a vast uh, propaganda activity, very sophisticated. Uh, they create video productions that are uh, somewhat astonishing. I mean, they're the the quality of these productions are, are amazing. They also produce uh, uh, audio tapes, uh, jihadi magazines, and so on. And they've developed a distribution mechanism, uh, largely publishing their materials through jihadi web forums to make all of this uh, stuff available to sympathists and followers and, and others like that. Uh, so uh, the propaganda piece is crucially important. In fact, uh, al Zawahiri has said that at least 50% of what they're about is, is the propaganda piece. Bin Laden has said that 90% of what they're about is, is the propaganda piece. I mean, this is, this is really crucially important because these guys have been, uh, as a result of 9-11, uh, they, they lost their operational capabilities, their ability to command and control, and what they had left was the ability to exhort and incite jihad in others. Okay, all right. Al-Qaeda's efforts to reconstitute its operational capabilities. Um, Al-Qaeda uh, is generally, or was generally believed to be in South uh, Waziristan, in this bluish area down here. This is the, the, the Pakistani, Afghan uh, tribal uh, regions. Uh, and um, about um, half of the Al-Qaeda leadership uh, after the Battle of Tora Bora in December 2001, is believed to have moved to these tribal, uh, tribal areas. This included uh, bin Laden and uh, the cadres around him. Another group went to, uh, went to Iran 
and uh, many of them are still uh, apparently in Iranian custody, uh, interestingly enough. All right, um, Al-Qaeda established a command structure. Um, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan has a military emir. It's had a whole sequence of military emirs. They have a short life, uh, shelf life uh, as a result of uh, predator attacks, but they established a command structure for action in the Afghan PAC theater. Uh, in part to support Mullah Omar and the Taliban in Afghanistan. And there are believed, I think, to be maybe 100 Al-Qaeda guys in Afghanistan supporting Mullah Omar. Um, and, and some of those have, are, are getting, uh, um, I think, uh, rolled up um, in the uh, marine operations in, in Marja. Um, but they also had an emir uh, for sort of internal activities against Pakistan more locally, okay? Uh, as part of their survival strategy and as part of their effort to improve their operational capabilities, they've also sought to establish uh, friendly relations with a wide variety of militant groups. Uh, if anybody, I don't know if any of you have looked at uh, Pakistani militant groups, but it's a veritable potpourri of uh, acronyms and, and groups with different orientations, uh, Kashmirian, anti-Indian, anti-Iranian, and, and, and so on. But they've, they've tried to establish good relations with these other groups and they've cooperated um, uh, on, um, on, on some operations, helped with planning and, and, and doing things like that. They also have sought, and this is important, they've sought to uh, inculcate their Salafi uh, jihadi ideology in many of these other militant organizations because it makes them feel more comfortable working with these organizations and these organizations generally seem pretty, pretty receptive. Okay, they have established a set of branded affiliates. Um, there's been at least five branded affiliates, you know, mergers and acquisitions, branding. These are sort of strategic decisions, you know, like a, like a corporation. Al-Qaeda takes this stuff very, very seriously. They, as I mentioned in the Abu Musab uh, al-Zarqawi al al case, um, prolonged negotiations uh, typically are involved here. Al-Qaeda has to ascertain that they actually bring something to the table and that they're ideologically aligned closely enough with Al-Qaeda and subscribe to you know, the same views uh, to be able to justify bringing them into the inner orbits of the Al-Qaeda uh, universe. And if you're in the inner orbits of the Al-Qaeda universe, uh, with that you get uh, distribution using uh, Al-Qaeda's uh, uh, distribution agent, the Al-Fajr Media Center, which does the posting to the jihadi web forum. So you get the al Fajr brand on your propaganda and that, and that sort of thing. So there's some amenities that actually come with it and you get the, uh, you get the uh, jihadi chic aspect of being an Al-Qaeda uh, affiliate um, as well. So these branded affiliates um, have been named in a number of different places. I mentioned Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Arabian Peninsula. There have been two different versions of that. The Saudis stamped, up, stamped out a version of that organization back in 2004, 2005. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb which is largely in Algeria, but also the Sahel region, uh, Niger, Mauritania. They, they've been uh, active uh, there recently. Uh, there's also, uh, or was, uh, an announcement of an Al-Qaeda in the land of Kinana, Al-Qaeda in Egypt, but it was essentially a public relations stunt. There was, there was no there there. There really was not a, uh, an Al-Qaeda group to be dubbed uh, Al-Qaeda in the land of Kinana. Um, this is one of a couple of examples where they've pulled PR stunts where there really is no substance behind the, uh, the public announcements they've made. Most recently, um, intelligence uh, officials have leaked that uh, communications have been reported between Al-Qaeda Central and the Pakistani uh, uh, tribal areas and um, affiliates in Yemen, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and also uh, affiliates uh, in Somalia. There's a cadre of Arabs uh, numbering, I think in the low hundreds, uh, it's estimated to be, of uh, Al-Qaeda related Arabs who are operating in Somalia uh, alongside the Mujahideen youth movement, Al-Shabaab, the indigenous uh, uh, Somali Salafi Jihadi organization. So this, um, th this uh, uncovering of the uh, higher level of chatter in the intelligence community, um, I think, uh, 
worried many intelligence professionals because it suggested that, that Al-Qaeda might actually be able to coordinate uh, with these, uh, these other entities uh, more effectively than they had been able uh, before, and that as a result, they might be able to begin to, if not control, at least command uh, operations uh, by some of these entities. And most recently, of course, on Christmas Day, the Nigerian Umar uh, Farouk Abdul Muttalab uh, attempted to down that Northwest airliner uh, flying from Amsterdam uh, to Detroit. Uh, he evidently aimed to drop it um, on Detroit as it, was, uh, as it was coming in. So I think this gives you sort of a backdrop to their efforts to restore their uh, capabilities to undertake uh, uh, operations uh, against the U.S. and gives you a sense of why it might be that the Director of National Intelligence earlier this month might have said that you know, this, this threat is so high and that there's a, 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 a near certainty that um, Al-Qaeda would attempt to attack us again. Okay, so uh, this is a very real threat Recently, I think this threat has, um, there's some indications that the threat recently has increased. And this may, in fact, be a result of, in some, in some ways, um, uh, some difficulties uh, that they've been having. So I have a yes, but. Yeah, the threat, threat is very important. We need to be you know, very attentive to it, work hard at it. But it's also true that they're under tremendous pressure. And this may, in part, be why they're starting to act out again, because they have uh, they haven't uh, managed to uh, launch another attack since 9-11. Uh, All right, uh, let me go through a, sort of a litany of their failures um, since 9-11. Uh, their front organization, the Islamic State of Iraq, is down, if not yet out. They're still able to uh, undertake truck bombings and that sort of thing, but the uh, numbers of their attacks, their ability to do sort of insurgent actions and things like that are down. Their propaganda is down, and uh, by all accounts, they're... Uh, uh, they're not the organization that they were under uh, Zarqawi in his heyday. Uh, in the Pakistani tribal regions, they have drones overhead, which have dramatically thinned uh, their, their leadership structure, taken out a great many uh, Egyptians and, and middle levels and, and, and high levels. And um, it, it also has eliminated uh, a number of their military commanders in uh, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan the entity that coordinates with the Taliban. And that has helped to break the linkage between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, I think, in, um, in uh, uh, developing trust and sort of ongoing support uh, to the Taliban. Now on the ground, they've complained about spies. This guy right here is named Abu Yahya al-Libi. Uh, he is sort of a house uh, theologian, if you will, Ayman al-Zawahiri has a great many pretensions, and for some time he, he seemed to be representing himself as an expert on Islamic jurisprudence, and um, it, it didn't play very well. So uh, uh, this guy uh, has been brought in, and he's actually one of the most prolific uh, of, of the figures in Al-Qaeda releases. He writes books, he writes essays, he gives speeches, he gives sermons, and, and so on. Olivia uh, wrote a book on uh, the jurisprudence of, uh, of spies and uh, essentially gave carte blanche to killing anybody, <laughs> any Muslims who turned on Al-Qaeda. All right, and this, uh, this signaled two things. One, it signaled that they were very worried about this. Second thing it signaled was they were likely to undertake a campaign of assassinations against individuals who they feared might be uh, turning, uh, turning on Al-Qaeda. And he had some reason to worry about this. Baitullah Massoud um, was uh, the uh, Tariqi Taliban Pakistan uh, emir, uh, was uh, betrayed, and he was uh, killed in a drone attack. His successor, uh, Hakimullah Massoud, uh, also a TTP guy, uh, was killed in a predator attack. And the TTP has been sort of a key ally of Al-Qaeda and has provided sanctuary and protection while they've been in uh, South Waziristan. So th some of these protections that they've had um, have, have, have diminished, and um, there's a great concern right now about um, spies feeding intelligence to these predators or to forces on the ground that, uh, that might uh, further uh, uh, diminish the capabilities and uh, result in uh, greater losses in the leadership ranks of Al-Qaeda. Also on the ground, the Pakistanis have undertaken a military offensive. They started um, in uh, Swat Valley and then uh, 
when there was a thrust towards the uh, Pakistani military uh, facilities, uh, they decided uh, that they also, uh, uh, once they'd finished with the SWAT problem, they also were going to uh, undertake action in uh, South Waziristan. And that decision became easy because the Taraki Taliban Pakistan, uh, uh, led by Baitullah Massoud, uh, was actually undertaking attacks against the Pakistani security establishment. So that may have been a red line for the Pakistanis, but in, in any event, they've undertaken an offensive uh, in South Waziristan. Uh, it was primarily aimed at the TTP, Taraki Taliban Pakistan, but also uh, Uzbeks. The Uzbeks were closely affiliated with Al-Qaeda and part of their command structure. Right? And uh, by all accounts, uh, they were displaced, perhaps to North Waziristan or, uh, or, or, or elsewhere. So this offensive uh, essentially moved into the area that Al-Qaeda leaders were believed to be in, uh, may have forced them uh, to decamp, but almost certainly put them under, um, uh, under uh, additional pressure. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, we've just uh, begun uh, an offensive in Marja. The Marines in Helmand province just began their offensive there. A number of Taliban leaders uh, have sought refuge in Pakistan. Um, some of those were recently rolled up. So Al-Qaeda's Taliban ally also um, is under pressure. And this is important because the Taliban also has provided sanctuary and security and, and, and that sort of thing. Now on the ideological front, Al-Qaeda has uh, been under attack by a, a, a number of clerics from both within the movement and outside of the movement. Um, this includes uh, most uh, famously uh, Sayyid Imam um, al-Sharif, who was the former ideologue of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad organization and um, a, uh, a colleague of Ayman al-Zawahiri's, who wrote the, the the guide to <laughs> theological guide or jurisprudential guide for Salafi jihadism many years ago and did a complete recantation on this. He's in Egyptian prison right now, but this really shook the jihadi establishment. There are others who also have attacked Al-Qaeda. Uh, Salman al-Auda, um, a, uh, a Saudi Salva cleric, awakening a cleric in Saudi Arabia, a mentor of bin Laden's, wrote an open letter to bin Laden calling upon him to repent. Yusuf al-Qaradawi, a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated uh, uh, cleric, uh, wrote a book on the jurisprudence of jihad that, uh, that challenged al-Qaeda's conception of the legal aspects of this as well. So the ideological attacks have been coming from very, very prominent voices within the Muslim community. There's been declining Muslim support. If you look at the Pew Global Attitudes data, which really I think is probably the best data in terms of time series data, you can see a catastrophic drop in the percentage who have confidence that bin Laden will do the right thing in, uh, in uh, world affairs. Uh, one of the leaders of uh, um, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Mustafa Abu al-Yazid, uh, al -Yazid, sort of a uh, jihadi uh, accountant, uh, complains all the times about finances. He, he, he complains that, you know, I, I, have, I have the individuals who can carry the suicide vests, but I can't afford the suicide vests anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, is, this is good news, I think, for us. Most recently, um, you, some of you might have seen that um, Ambassador Holbrook, the uh, State Department coordinator for Afghanistan and Pakistan, was talking about uh, uh, the potential field of jihad for Al-Qaeda stretching into Central Asia. He'd been sort of following that uh, fairly closely for some time, so this came as no surprise to us. But what did, what did come as a surprise was the news report uh, suggested that some of the Uzbeks were moving back to Uzbekistan. Uh, they've been sort of an, an, an intrinsic part of the Al-Qaeda command structure and their operational capabilities for some time. And this is a really, if true, this is a really interesting report because it suggests maybe there's more of a wholesale um, abandonment um, of Al-Qaeda's position uh, within the uh, federally administered tribal areas. So lots of different vectors for pressure, um, pressure on Al-Qaeda. And as I mentioned, uh, this might very well be um, a partial explanation, at least, uh, for why it might be that um, Al-Qaeda might want, want to try to turn the tables. Okay, let's uh, move to the next item. This is the current Al-Qaeda threat. Um, you can 
find this online. This is testimony from uh, the Director of National Intelligence, Dennis Blair. Um, uh, he, I think he testified both uh, in the House and in the Senate. Um, and uh, they, they do on an annual basis, uh, the, the DNI and the FBI director and director of the DIA will go before the Congress and provide sort of a net assessment of the threats facing the nation, not just terrorist threats, but all threats. Uh, I follow this pretty closely. In, in past years, they've identified Al Qaeda as the greatest terrorist threat. That's a, a continuing uh, motif in these uh, in these reports and in the testimony. But this uh, this year, the DNI said something um, that was a bit more pointed. Al Qaeda maintains its intent to attack the homeland, preferably with a large scale operation that would cause mass casualties, harm the U.S. economy, or both. And Mrs. Pelosi uh, asked him, well, what probability would you put on uh, another attempt in the, next, uh, in the next six months? And his response was, it is certain that there will be at least one other attempt on the US over the next six months. So my sense is that the pressure Al Qaeda is under may be forcing their hand, but, just, but also because they've been able to perhaps establish some communications with their affiliate in Yemen, um, and, uh, and Somalia, that they, uh, they might be restoring some of their um, operational uh, capability um, outside of the federally administered uh, tribal areas. Okay, so what kind of operations is Al Qaeda known for? Well, they're really quite fixated on airliners, uh, as, you, <laughs> as you probably know, 9-11 uh, style attacks uh, blowing airliners up, um, either over water or over cities. Those are sort of recurring, uh, recurring themes. There have been a number of plans uh, that have been uncovered and, and thwarted uh, in the process. They're also known for truck and vehicle bombings. This is the uh, Marriott in uh, Islamabad, uh, which was uh, attacked with a, a, a truck bomb. Uh, suicide vest bombings for assassination. Uh, some of you, uh, probably most of you, uh, remember that uh, the CIA forward operating base uh, in coast, um, uh, that uh, a, um, a jihadi ideologue, really a strategic writer, a very fairly prominent one, uh, who is uh, believed to be um, a, um, a double agent against Al Qaeda and who's promising to help uh, uncover um, Al Qaeda um, in South Waziristan, actually showed up with a explosive vest and blew himself out, you know, blew himself up at the uh, at the gates killing uh, seven uh, CIA officers, which I believe is the greatest loss the CIA has ever faced in a single uh, incident uh, in history. Um, you'll remember as well the Mumbai uh, attacks where a team of, um, I think about eight, uh, I think it was 10 uh, militants uh, arrived by water and then split up and then attacked a whole host of Western sites, Jewish-related sites, and, and others, and sort of went on this, uh, uh, this uh, spree of violence for two or three days while the media watched. Um, it is said, according to some press reporting, that Al-Qaeda might have advised lashkar e taiba which is believed to have been responsible uh, for these attacks. Al-Qaeda might have advised LET to undertake, undertake this particular kind of attacks. That, the, the plan they had before actually was not very ambitious and Al-Qaeda thought this would cause a bigger splash and, and it did. So they had at least seemingly some sort of hand in this. Now, note one, um, Al-Qaeda uh, seems, in addition to being somewhat fixated on airliners, they wanna kill more people with each, <laughs> with each event and that's sort of the story of um, Al-Qaeda's operations before 2001 and up to 9-11. Up to and it is said that uh, there was a, um, an attack on the New York City subway system that um, uh, was scotched because it wouldn't kill sufficiently larger numbers uh, than the 9-11 attacks. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that's, uh, that's some reporting that, uh, that many, of us, um, many of us have seen. So there's a sort of a bigger is better quality uh, to this. Second note is, um, Al-Qaeda has been interested in recruiting Europeans, uh, Americans, and others because they can move more easily across borders. And this is important 
because having Western passports and being able to move freely makes it more difficult to thwart uh, some of these operations. And we've seen, I think, a number of cases um, of young uh, American Muslims who have gone abroad, uh, gotten training, joined the jihad, and uh, some of whom appear to have had the intent to, uh, to attack the U.S. or fight U.S. Uh, US forces abroad. Okay, so this is, this is sort of what the menu looks like in terms of the kinds of things that they might, uh, they might choose to do, if you will. All right, there is also um, a, uh, beyond the immediate threat of, um, of attacks against the U.S., I think there's a, a longer term uh, threat that's inherent in Al-Qaeda's ideology. Uh, let me quickly go through some of the, the faces here, just so you have an idea of who these, who these uh, guys are. This is a banner uh, for a very sophisticated uh, propaganda uh, release called Winds of Paradise. This was the fourth installment of Winds of Paradise. And Winds of Parad Paradise lionizes so-called martyrs and eulogizes so-called martyrs who have died in, in jihadi action. And the principal focus of this is the guy in the top right corner and the guy here, um, his name was Abu Laith al-Libi, one of the Libyan uh, cadre, uh, young, young Libyans who had moved to uh, pretty important leadership uh, positions with al within Al-Qaeda Central. Um, al-Libi is believed to have been the military commander for Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and also a Taliban commander. He was a key bridge between Al-Qaeda and, uh, and the Taliban. And he was, uh, he was removed uh, by a predator, um, I think, um, I think two, maybe two years ago. All right. Now he's, interestingly enough, he's looking across at this guy who's got the scarf on his face. Well, that's Abdullah uh, Saeed al-Libi, who was uh, a successor. <laughs> As, as military emir with, uh, in Al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, he actually followed Abu Laif pretty shortly after becoming military commander of uh, 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 Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. He also, was, um, he also was removed by a predator strike. And this only happened uh, just recently. Now the individuals in the center, let me just go from right to left. The guy in the white skull cap to the immediate left of Abu Laif al-Libi is Abdullah Azam, who was a Palestinian who worked with, uh, with Osama uh, bin Laden during the Afghan days and, uh, and uh, was assassinated, I think, in 1989 or something. Some suspect bin Laden's hand in that assassination, uh, whether uh, it may very well be true, uh, in which case they're sort of shamelessly <laughs> lionizing a guy that they were responsible for for removing, uh, but that's uh, Abdullah Azam. He's a, he was a very important uh, ideologue uh, and writer. The guy to his immediate left in the uh, black turban is Mustafa Abu al-Yazid. Uh, he is the so-called general official of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and the jihadi accountant that I was talking about before. He did finances and, and other kinds of things uh, uh, for Al-Qaeda and uh, he's a, sort of an organization man, I guess. The younger guy to the immediate left of the guy in, uh, of, of Mustafa Abu al Yazid is the American Adam Gadan, also known as Azam al Amriki. This guy um, is um, a uh, graduate of American universities and he, uh, he does these screeds against the U.S. He's a propagandist uh, through and through. Um, He's entertaining and, and, and quite obnoxious to, to watch, um, actually, but he's figured pretty prominently in very many um, Al-Qaeda video productions. And I think they must have calculated that somehow he would be a good communicator to reach American audiences, but uh, he just, his, his Q scores just seem so low to me that I can't imagine that he'd, he'd be doing particularly well with American audiences. Uh, the guy in the center is Ayman al-Zawahiri, al the, the uh, uh, the number two um, in Al-Qaeda. The guy to the left of him is Abu Yahya al-Libi, who was on that earlier, um, that earlier uh, display I presented, sort of the house theologian, and then of course um, uh, Osama uh, bin Laden. And I learned this guy standing here, sort of straight along the right margin with sort of the TAM, the Afghan TAM, um, is, 
a Uyghur, a Chinese Muslim, who evidently uh, died uh, while he was training for bomb making. So these are, these are the types of individuals who are lionized in here. Oh, in addition, we have Abu Musab al-Zarqawi right here to the, in the center, uh, center right. And I think that uh, on the left, that might be the blind Egyptian, uh, blind Egyptian sheikh who's in US, uh, US custody, I'm not sure. Okay, so this is sort of orients you in terms of who some of these characters are. Um, they use these uh, various propaganda products to reach a variety of different audiences. They've done their audience segmentation and analysis. They've tried to identify key themes that will resonate with these different audiences and so on. And, but all of their, uh, all of their uh, writings and speeches and so on are really couched in the jurisprudence, such as it is, of Salafi jihadi thought. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Salafis are a very small strand within Sunni Islam. Most of them are pietists or aim towards political action to, uh, to promote social reform or other kinds of things like that. Only a tiny sliver of them are Salafi jihadis. And the Salafi jihadis, the thing that's distinctive about them is they throw away uh, 1,400 years of Islamic jurisprudence. They promote uh, jihad as armed struggle as being equivalent to belief, which is a very, you know, very profound uh, thing to say. And they essentially want to get to the killing. They're, they're all about uh, undertaking um, action against uh, their perceived enemies. Uh, as I mentioned, Al-Qaeda's ideology uh, has by design infected other groups. Al-Qaeda has been very active at trying to promote the Salafi jihadi viewpoint to uh, Pakistani militant groups, for example. They have a huge uh, cache of propaganda that they put out over the years. Uh, much of this is available on jihadi web forums. It's been downloaded to PCs. It's on CDs and, and other kinds of personal media and so on. Uh, it's been distributed pretty, uh, pretty widely. Um, and so the conclusion I, I draw here, I, I actually recently looked at a number of uh, violent social movements um, over history. And one of the things that was quite interesting to me was that um, I think that four um, about half of these violent social movements um, actually were snuffed out on more than one occasion. And then somehow the paddles got put back on them and someone resurrected the ideological package. They were smart leaders, they were savvy politicians, and they managed to pick up and carry on where they were before. And so this got me um, quite uh, concerned about the possibilities that Al-Qaeda's ideological package might survive even past uh, the, the life of the, uh, the organization uh, itself. And so the worry is that even after Al-Qaeda is gone, that its ideology uh, may very well be animating the actions of, um, of jihadis who've been part of that organization, uh, who form splinter groups, and then you know, could actually uh, try to uh, coalesce into another uh, future uh, organization, Al-Qaeda 2.0, let's say. Um, okay, lastly, the point that uh, ideology and the Salafi jihadi ideology is at the heart, um, at its heart, it's a, a theological and jurisprudential redefinition of Islam. It's really only going to be countered effectively by Muslims. And I think there's a lot of this action that's going on right now that goes on under most of our radar screens. When I talk to people about the actions that uh, the Muslim community worldwide has taken, the clerics who have taken stands against Al-Qaeda, the open, um, open letters and, um, and uh, signatories of petitions and other kinds of things like that, uh, people are generally astonished that there is a move afoot uh, to try to uh, challenge Al-Qaeda's uh, ideology. But I think it, it, it's true to say that they, uh, they really only it really only can be countered by Muslims. Okay, two, two levels of responses. First is sort of the US uh, policy response. I happened to come across this map and it sounded very much like what uh, Ambassador Holbrook was talking about in terms of expanding Al-Qaeda's uh, span of action and interest into the Central Asian uh, area. So I decided to include this, this map here. The uh, President Obama has uh, stated that uh, policy objective in connection with Afghanistan and Pakistan is, is in the top bullet. Disrupt, dismantle, and defeat Al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan and prevent their return to either country in the future. Now I think that 
most effective way of doing that in, in, in many, most cases, is intelligence and law enforcement cooperation. Uh, we've, I think, had great success in rolling up uh, operational networks, in rolling up funding networks, and rolling up logistics networks and pipelines and things of that nature. But I think military action also plays a role. Uh, for example, in the federally administered uh, tribal areas, obviously the predator attacks, I think, have been uh, fairly successful at thinning the ranks of uh, Al-Qaeda's leaders and uh, putting them on defensive. Um, and the, the key actions there are to really kill or capture these leaders and uh, disrupt, uh, disrupt the networks, okay? At the policy level, there's also a, a need to support efforts to counter um, Al-Qaeda's uh, ideology. I think it's very difficult for the U.S. government to do directly. We, we can't speak, you know, uh, authoritatively on these matters. Um, I do think, though, um, there's another level to our response. Um, and I, I was struck by how this sort of looks like an I want you recruiting poster. You know, so the question <laughs> was transformed into what can you do about, about Al-Qaeda? And my, my view here is that, you know, the first thing is this is, you know, I, I, I follow this stuff very closely over a long span of time and I, I've got some uh, emotional distance from it because it, it becomes, you know, it becomes a puzzle and becomes a problem. Um, you know, but don't despair, you know, don't despair here. We're a very strong nation and I think we're not doing so badly um, against these guys. Hard to tell when we might uh, eliminate this organization, Al-Qaeda, uh, but um, you, know, you should really just live your life and, and not, be, uh, not be paralyzed by this or, or concerned about this. But I do think remaining resolute and patient about the outcome, Al-Qaeda is looking at this as a multi-generational war. They have, they're taking the long view on this, and I think that we probably need to take the long view on it as well. So being resolute and patient, but also demanding persistence and accountability in government actions. And I don't mean this in, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, just simply looking to find fault, but looking in the sense of trying to make sure our government is adapting in ways to meet this adapting threat that we're facing because they're, they're gaming us all the time. They're looking for opportunities. They're trying to see what we do well, what, what, uh, what we don't do well, and they're adapting in terms of how uh, they wanna go about uh, attacking us. Now, I think it's also the case that local imams and the American Muslim community, in, um, in some ways, that's our ace in the hole here. You know, these, these folks are, are part of American civil society. They're fellow citizens. They have a vast contribution to make here. And I just enumerate uh, three of those. One is challenging Al-Qaeda's efforts to hijack Islam. I, I think this is crucially important and, and, um, and, and their efforts to incite violence against Americans. Second, and this is crucially important, especially given Al-Qaeda's desire to uh, have more Westerners or more uh, cadres that can move uh, uh, relatively easily across borders. And that is preventing young American Muslims from embracing Al-Qaeda's ideology, you know, trying to uh, trying to build buffers against this, trying to uh, engage, uh, engage these kids and uh, try to keep them from, from going down this path. Then lastly, I think there's a role here in educating uh, non-Muslims, um, the point that Al-Qaeda does not speak for Islam. Uh, I think that there are very many uh, in our country who identify Muslims with Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda with Muslims, and it, it, my sense is that we're talking about one out of 100,000 Muslims worldwide who are sort of actively involved in, uh, in, this, uh, in this movement and in this, in this organization. That's a tiny fraction, and uh, we don't want to be tarring with a broad brush the larger populations because what that does essentially is it pushes them more towards sympathy towards Al-Qaeda. All right, so this is, these are three crucially important roles, I think, that um, our uh, American Muslim community can play and, and are playing uh, uh, right now. Okay. Let me just... Um, let me just finish with one last slide. Being from California, this, uh, this caught my eye. <laughs> and, and with that, I will conclude. Uh, I'd welcome comments, uh, questions, challenges. Yeah.
Thank you. I'd like to pick right up where you left off uh, and ask a question that relates to where you started. In your opinion, why didn't the 9-11 attack accomplish the Al-Qaeda goal of uniting the Muslim world against the United States? And I guess really what I'm asking is, are they delusional? Is Al-Qaeda delusional? Mm -hmm. uh, my, my sense is um, that they, from their frame of reference, didn't understand that humans would re react with revulsion to the mass killing of more than 3,000 people of whatever, of, of whatever stripe. I mean, that's a, that's a human instinct. It's not a Western or American or any, it's a human uh, instinct. And I think that uh, that revulsion um, essentially left much of the world uh, saying, well, these guys are going to get what's coming to them. So they, they just simply miscalculated. Now, I think, I think they're delusional in the sense that they have a construct of um, human affairs and what will work that just really doesn't seem to be grounded in how I tend, at least tend to think about how people, uh, people respond. I think they're, they're logically consistent in their viewpoints. You know, there's, I mean, they're very, they're very exceedingly consistent in their viewpoints and in their arguments and other kinds of things like that. They just don't get it. And one of the key things they don't get is that um, if you end up killing innocent and killing in particular innocent Muslims, um, you're, you're going to lose, uh, lose support. And that's one of the principal findings, I think, um, uh, from Al-Qaeda's uh, Al -Qaeda's behavior. They also have a tendency to go after their own base. You know, in, in Iraq, they were going after uh, Sunni tribal leaders and Sunni insurgent leaders and, and fighters, and they were, they were capping guys who normally might be sympathetic to them. They just have this tendency, they have a very exclusionary view, and they go after uh, all of their enemies, and the list of enemies is so vast that there's, there's just no discrimination, I think. So I think that the nihilism of this, this group became pretty apparent, and the fact that they're just very effective mass murderers became very clear to the Muslim world, and um, you know, I think that, um, that largely accounts um, you know, accounts for the failure for Muslims to rise to, uh, to support them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming tonight. Oh, thank you. And then also, um, considering you outlined earlier the uh, Al-Qaeda al-Qaeda strategy against the United States. Yes. Considering that we currently are in two wars with the general backing from Wall Street and we are spending billions of dollars every year, is it reasonable to say that that strategy has worked at least to some degree in against the U.S.? Well, I think that um, I think that Al Qaeda was uh, able to exploit uh, the U.S. war in Iraq successfully for a time, um, and I think that we may have underestimated uh, the extent to which um, Iraq would serve as a recruiting poster. Um, for these guys. Uh, so from that vantage point, I think that there might have been some you know, miscalculations um, on this. Um, I don't know whether I can uh, characterize myself as optimistic about the outcome in Iraq, but we have a timetable for withdrawal um, and you know, there's some uncertainties in that. And I really would recommend all of you reading General Odierno's uh, comments because he's very frank about how he's viewing this. He's not sugarcoating anything. Um, so. Uh, I think you know. I think from that vantage point that um, that uh, we we ran into some difficulties, um, you know, uh, within uh, within Iraq. I think there's um, there's been less uh, support 
generally um, within Afghanistan and in Pakistan because they're sort of out of the core Arab regions and Arab, you know, the, the Arab core is really where I think Al Qaeda draws uh, draws most of its uh, support. But with the tanking of the Islamic State of Iraq, the Al Qaeda affiliate uh, in Iraq, I think there's been some displacement of fighters. They've gone off to different places. Some of them have gone off, actually gone off to Pakistan or Afghanistan. And um, Al Qaeda uh, has actually attempted to undertake a strategic shift to Afghanistan and Pakistan. They have argued that because the U.S. Well, first of all, they declared victory in Iraq. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> their organization there kind of is, is kind of in, 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 in pretty disheveled um, at this point. But they declared victory on account of the election of President Obama and the establishment of a timetable. And then they argued that because the U.S. was making the Afghan PAC region the principal focus, they also had to do that. So that necessitated a shift in their strategy to this other location. Now, they haven't said anything about the continued viability of Iraq as the nucleus of a caliphate, and I don't think they're going to want to say very much about that because it's not, it's not going very well for them. But they've tried to sort of shift attention to the fight in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan. But as I, as I was describing earlier, they're also under a lot of pressure there. It's not clear they're doing particularly well. I mean, it, was a, it was a complicated question you asked. I hope that's a, a reasonable response. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes, sir. In his book, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, Thomas Friedman makes a big, a strong connection between petrol dollars and terrorism and the uh, you know, sort of educational brainwashing of young men. Yeah. Uh, do you have any strong disagreements with some of the conclusions that Thomas Friedman made in his book? Well, you know, I'll, I'll be able to answer that very simply. I haven't read Thomas Friedman's book, so I can't really comment on his, on his arguments. But if, if he's, um, if you're, uh, I, I think I've uh, understood uh, secondhand that he said that it's cheap to educate somebody in a Pakistani madrasa and expensive for the U.S. to conduct, you know, kinds of operations. And that's, that's almost, certainly, uh, almost certainly true. Um, uh, and there are a whole set of policy things you can, and strategy things you want to do about that. You want to sort of take the Augean stables approach, I think, to a lot of these madrasas, right, so that they're not training little killers and, and bombers and, and things like that. It's a, it's a, it's a very tough, tough problem. Um. Hi. I have uh, two questions regarding the Iran. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, First of all, I know that recently um, Ayatollah Khamenei has publicly declared that Iran has um, no need for um, a nuclear weapon and he's declared that the um, actually the foundational basis of the Quran does not support uh, nuclear capacity. Now, my question is, um, this is directly contrasted with the openly public statements of um, Ahmadinejad yeah. who has basically um, said that they are going to go forward with uh, building a nuclear weapon. And I want to know, first of all, what is the um, significance of that? I mean, is that to kind of you know, cloud uh, international leaders? Um, and secondly, um, if Iran continues down this, this path of belligerent, how likely do you think it is that Israel will take unilateral action yeah. Against Iraq. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think um, I think there's some obfuscation uh, here about the, in, the intentions of the Iranian nuclear program. Um, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, it's 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 widely believed that there's a civilian program, and that's pretty much the program they talk about in public. And there's some involvement of the AEA and inspections and, and things like that. But they're also engaged in development of these secret facilities. There's also believed to be a, um, a secret military program that sort of hangs underneath this civilian program. So understanding exactly what they're up to is, is really, um, really quite, quite difficult. Uh, maybe Ahmadinejad has not briefed uh, the supreme leader. I don't know. Maybe he didn't get the memo. I, I, I don't know. But it's, uh, if, you know, with, a, with a, military, a nuclear and military program, it would be difficult for me to believe that the supreme 
leader really thinks that they're not sort of laying the groundwork. Now, there, there are different ways to parse this. I mean, I think that, I think that it, it can be a bit confusing because it, they may have to sort of gravitate towards a single position across a lot of different constituencies and factions and that sort of thing. And sometimes there are a lot of noisy signals that are sent that are pretty confusing to us, but they probably get on their cell phones and make some calls and you know, try to get on the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, same sheet of music. But um, you know, I, I think it's, it's certainly possible that this ultimately the result of all of that is that it's, it turns out to be sort of a well-calibrated strategy for, to just incrementally raise, you know, raise the bar with each successive announcement. And uh, whether they intend to develop a full military program or get to the point where they have a breakout capability where they could have a, a nuclear weapon very very quickly if they wanted to. Now, I don't have any I, you know, I don't have any idea. I mean with, I just read the papers uh, like like you on this and I think it's uh, it's something we're just going to have to uh, watch uh, very closely but the uh, I think the uh, the announcement of um, actually I, I don't know if you saw this but Ahmadinejad ordered his atomic energy organization director to enrich to 20% in a, in a, in a public uh, sort of press conference. He's like, please enrich to 20% to 20%. He, gave, you know, he gave the order. So he's playing a very provocative uh, came here, game here. And uh, you know, my guess is that um, different factions, different constituencies have different positions. And um, uh, in, in part, this is why I think the domestic politics situation gets tangled up so much with the nuclear situation uh, as, as, as well. So um, again, an, a long-winded response to a complicated, first part of your complicated question. Um, I, on the Israel uh, question, you know, I think that really the key here is to think about ways to provide Israel with uh, security assurances so that, um, so that um, a, a strike that's, well, uh, uh, there's a strategy here that focuses on trying to deter the development or, or coerce or influence the development um, uh, of uh, Iranian nuclear um, capabilities such that they don't, they don't go into sort of a military kind of mode. And so there are diplomatic things they can, there can be done, carrots and sticks and so on. So there's a broader political and diplomatic strategy, I think. But I think, too, there's a... Um, a strategy that relies on um, um, a military component, perhaps, to uh, let's say provide ballistic missile defenses. Uh, if there were, let's say, boost phase intercept capabilities that could reliably shoot down any Iranian ballistic missile over Iranian territory, well, that would seem to be a pretty good thing to have. Now, technically, there's sort of speed, distance, and warning issue. There are a whole sort of operational and technical characteristics that you'd have to sort of uh, work out to be able to get to that, um, that sort of uh, level of capability. U.S. is taking action to increase early warning systems in the Gulf. They're selling Patriot missile batteries to a lot of the Gulfies and, and that sort of thing. So uh, there may be some movement sort of on that military front. There's also some discussion of um, uh, offering extended deterrence and saying that if, um, if uh, Israel or uh, Saudis or um, others of these states are attacked by Iranian nuclear weapons, uh, that the U.S. would respond with its own nuclear weapons. I mean, flexible. There's an element of that in U.S. strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe um, in, in, in the Cold War and uh, threatening the Soviets if they were to overrun Europe. So there's some strategy-level kinds of things that can be done here as well. And I think, you know, my sense is that um, you know, we're only just beginning to think through some of these uh, some of these options. I certainly haven't sort of figured out the suite of things we ought to be trying to do. I'm just hopeful that you know, if the permanent five moves effectively against Iran, that they can be persuaded to you know, cut out the shenanigans and uh, and cut out the you know additional development of. Uh, of, uh, of refinement capabilities and, and not move to the next level where they're declaring that they have 60% or 90% uh, enrichment. Uh, so we'll just have to see um, how that goes. But it's going to take some really, I think, some really hard thinking from some really smart people to, to, uh, to figure this one out.
mentioned earlier that fighters um, or combatants are using al-Qaeda for different areas. And um, when we practice in the section of the stronghold of al-Qaeda, mm. Europe was in London, and um, French people go to Chechnya and they want to protect them. So what possible things could they pull from having a base in Chechnya? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't, We've been watching Doku Umarov and his so-called Islamic um, um, Islamic uh, Emirate of the Caucasus. He's not really an Al Qaeda guy. I'd, I'd consider him to be a fellow traveler. He's Salafi jihadi in orientation, but he, he was never an Al Qaeda branded uh, branded affiliate. They occasionally will give a shout out <laughs> to Doku Umarov. <laughs> Keep up the good work up there against those Russians, uh, but. Uh, there, he's not really, I think, a particularly attractive option for Al Qaeda Central uh, to move. I think that, you know, I think that uh, there are probably better places for them. I'm hope, I, I think they probably hope not to have to move in the first instance, but if forced to move, I think there are probably other places they'd be um, more interested in moving. Um, the, the, I don't know what's happening with the, um, the Chechen fighters who are in the Al Qaeda. Um, Al Qaeda military organization. I only saw this sort of odd report about the Uzbeks um, evidently heading back to Uzbekistan, and I can't imagine a more hostile place for Uzbek jihadis to be than in Uzbekistan. So, more power to them. I think that's a great, you know, that's probably a great thing. But as, as to the Chechens, um, they might decide to return to Chechnya, they might decide to attach themselves to Doku Omarov and, and his, uh, his organization. Um, but um, that, 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 that Caucasus, Islamic Emirate uh, of, of the Caucasus, has been at some remove from Al Qaeda Central and not what I would consider to be in the inner orbits of the Al Qaeda uh, universe. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your questions and comments. <laughs>